I find more and more that I don't know. Um, so there may be things that I talk about that are new to you um, or that are different than the way that you would interpret them. And I just encourage you to stay curious. And if there's something that I say that you're like, mm, I don't think that's right, please let me know. If not in the presentation, perhaps after the presentation so that I can continue to learn too. Um, if you get curious and you're like, ha, huh, I never heard anything about that. I really encourage you to dig a little deeper, look for some sources, find out more. There's so much about trees that just like, there's this endless amount of learning in all aspects of trees, both the biology and ecology, but also the way that we relate to trees and have over like time immemorial, really. So I wanna say that we're on uh, Puyallup land and that the Puyallup have lived on and stewarded these lands since time immemorial. And they continue to do so today. And I wanna recognize that the land we are standing on was stolen from the Puyallup people, and that we acknowledge their stewardship, their force removal, and their continued fight to live on ancestral lands. And that said, I don't intend to speak for on behalf of anyone else, but to be an allyship, to be a supportive person um, in, the, in the hopes that we can all care for the land, the water, the animals, the people, and the plants. And when we think about plants, I like to think a little bit about the names that we use for trees, but what we call trees also helps us acknowledge um, our relationship to them. And I just want to give you an example. If we think about the Western Red Cedar, and that's the name I learned um, for this tree with these beautiful lace-like needles, there are actually a lot of other names uh, for uh, the Western Red Cedar. And if we think about it, the Puyallup people and other Coast Salish people have lived with the Western Red Cedar for time immemorial and have um, names for it. And one of them we're going to see about playing this audio, so you might have to listen up. Papayas. Papayas is Chris Bryden's um, voice from the Puyallup, uh, Puyallup tribal member who um, works with the Puyallup tribal language program and has done a lot of recordings for the shoot seed names for plants in this region. And you can check that out on the Pierce Conservation District's native plant sale. But we can also think about them as like Western red cedar is a vernacular uh, name and there are other vernacular names like giant arborvitae. And these things, these vernacular names, they cause lots of confusion. Um, like even that word cedar being in there, we call a lot of other things cedars. Some of those cedars are, are not that closely related actually to the Western red cedar. Um, and I, I have some ideas about why we use cedar to describe so many different things. And I think it has to do with a biblical reference to the cedar of Lebanon. And then um, trees have scientific names too, like genus and species. Thuya placata is Western red cedar, cedar. And even that is subject to change because what happens when our science evolves and we better understand how organisms are related to each other, then taxon taxonomists move things around and give them new names. And so, we have to kind of stay in relation with these plants in that way too, in this in sort of intellectual way. There are lots of ways that we can talk about plants and all of them have meaning and they have meaning to different people in different places uh, in different contexts. So just kind of keeping that in mind. And I think about keeping that in mind with this lens of acknowledging um, our past with plants and our collective past. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about me. Um, <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C.'s sister city is Kyoto, um, Japan. And in Kyoto, cherry blossoms are very important. It, throughout Japan, cherry blossoms are very important. And um, because Washington, D.C. is sister city to Kyoto, at one point there was this effort to plant many, many, many cherry blossoms along the tidal basin, um, all throughout the city, really. And um, when do they bloom? March 31st. <laughs> <laughs> Um, not always, but many times during the spring, during every year, cherry blossoms will bloom in D.C. right around my birthday. So as a small child, there are many pictures of me and my parents, me and my grandparents um, being around cherry blossoms. And so they always felt very special to me, you know, kind of all mixed up with family and with the place I was from, um, this relationship that the place has to another place. And, um, and, and to this too, that cherry blossoms are really fast. They bloom 
And then a big wind comes and all of those blossoms fall like snow and it's so beautiful. And it has this deeper meaning too that that cherry blossom is ephemeral in the same way that our life is ephemeral, in the same way that our, experience, our experiences are ephemeral. So even just in this cherry blossom blooming and losing its petals, there's this meaning, this bigger meaning that is relevant to many people in, in multiple cultures. Um, I sort of pulled that into my, my being, you know, at a very young age. I kind of, because we're here at University of Puget Sound, you have, there are is anybody a student here? Or, awesome. Okay. So um, University of Puget Sound has some really amazing trees on the campus. And some of you have maybe been at the uh, at some of the University of Puget Sound tree walks. Some heads nod nodding. Um, that's great. And one of them is um, is this giant sequoia here, um, right in the center of camp camp campus, like right at Wheelock Student Center big giant tree. This tree has its own history here on campus. Like students have a lot of history with this tree. Um, it's been pruned at the bottom for very particular reasons. I'm like, should I tell? I think I can. That because at one point people were climbing the tree. Uh, I won't go into detail about why they were climbing the tree, but it was um, a challenge that people took on. And one time somebody fell and they were they ended up being okay, luckily. But after that, they thought we're going to need to prune this tree up a bit. Um, but it has, so for like some, some groups of students, it has kind of a myth associated with it or a mythology associated with it, which is pretty neat. Um, but I also wanted to talk about like this tree as sort of a plant. And um, it has been in the Western part of the, of the continental US of what is now California. People have lived with it for a very long time. And in one place, uh, the Miwok people in California call it Wawona, which is also the sound of the northern spotted owl. Um, so I really love that because that that feeling that we can already, from the name, be thinking about its relationship to other plant, uh, other organisms, like the northern spotted owl. Um, it also has the name Tuspungish and Hemiwithic by people from Tool River. Uh, so even one plant, because it's um, spread out pretty far, different people come to name it different things over long periods of time. So where we are has a lot to do what we, with how we might talk about a tree. This tree has been around for 200 million years and was a dominant period, was dominant plant during the Jurassic period. So it was a dominant plant when dinosaurs were roaming around. Um, so you can start picturing like, yeah, where we are now having these big trees, these giant trees, that can live to be 3,500 years old. And just to put that into context, if we were with a tree, an, age, an aging sequoia tree um, that was 3,500 years old, it would have germinated at the same time that the Egyptians were building pyramids. Yeah, <laughs> those things, those big amazing things. And also, it's not just that the tree lives a long time, it can hold on to its cones for 20 years, that's kind of crazy. And when we think about fire adapted species, which it's one, um, holding on to seeds is an adaptation that's really important because then if there's a fire and you stay and you still have those seeds after the fire you can let go of those seeds and surprise, all that fresh sunlight and everything is now put to use. It's in need of protection. Uh, oops, this was supposed to be in front. I, I saw something online this is kind of goes back to that caveat that some things are different that show that said that this tree on this campus is centuries, multiple centuries old, which it, I don't think it is. I think it's about 100 years old. Anybody know if I'm correct? If, if, if Bill Boggs was here, he would know exactly how old it is. But I thought just for reference that I would show you this photograph of University of Puget Sound um, kind of early on. It moved to this, this location in 1924. And I think that this tree was planted right about then. So that's relevant because this is a very young tree in the world of a 3,500 year old plant. That's important too, because just to give you a sense of scale, there's one tree on record that grew 79 feet in 17 years. So when you look around, you see big trees. Think about big tree doesn't necessarily mean an old tree. Maybe it's only 100 years old, give or take, 110 years old, something like that. Um, that's a pretty big tree. What, um, what would it look like at 3,500 years old? Like, wow. 
That would be amazing. Um, so now I've talked a bit and it's your turn to just think a bit. Um, I want you to take a moment just to think about a tree that maybe has meaning to you. And you might find lots of trees come up, so you can let that happen too. <laughs> a whole forest of trees. And I want you to just think about what it was like to be in that place, who's with you, if anyone, what kind of meaning it has for you. Um, and just to get a, a sense for how that's going and maybe raise your hand if something popped up, if you had some thought and you don't have to share, it's it, just raising hand to see if a, a tree sort of popped in your head. Okay, all right. So now um, we get into a little bit of history, start moving towards um, the United States uh, and how we have trees in cities or some of the ways we have trees in cities. City beautiful movement, 1890 to 1900s, there was this idea that in that perhaps Cities should not be places just for industry and economy. Um, they shouldn't be just about efficiency. They should be places of aesthetic value for residents, which like, yeah, oh yeah. I mean, now it's like, of course they should be places where people want to live. But at that time in the 1890s, cities were really industrial places. So in 1893, there's this World Columbian Exposition in Chicago and People got really excited. It was all about like trees and cities was a big theme and and parks in cities, parks as places of gathering, um, places to recreate, place, places to kind of um, get away from it all, so to speak. And then right about this time, same time things are happening in Chicago, um, a story is published in Tacoma Daily Ledger on May 12, 1890, that describes this unwieldy piece of land. And in 1886, prior to that, Charles B. Wright and the Tacoma Land Company donate approximately 20 acres of land to Tacoma for a public park. Little thing here is that Tacoma Land Company also took all the trees down that were where Wright Park was, and then they donated it. Um, but after they cut all the trees down and it became this awkward and nearly useless place, then they donated it. And um, there was this big effort to plant a lot of trees. There were expectations that at least 300 shade trees would be planted within four years. And this, um, this fellow Edward Otto uh, was commissioned to design. And actually he played a very important role in other parks in Tacoma. Um, and the expectation was that this, this place, Wright Park, would be exclusively used for purposes of a public park. And this is really important. Like, I just kind of want to say it over and over that it was a for a public park, which means for the public to use without fees. Uh, and that's really important idea because, you know, the alternative is to have things that are more like amusement parks where you go to visit the trees and you pay um, to go to a private garden or something like that. And this idea that everybody should have access, regardless of your income, regardless of anything, you should have access to this public park is really important and is something that um, is carried forward today. So um, that's a pretty big move from a place that was awkward and undervalued. Um, and now it is 27 acres of public land with 600 trees and 145 species. And um, as Ruben Casas, who did a lot of great research on this stuff on Wright Park and, um, and a lot of things related to parks in Tacoma, Proposed, designed, and built in an era of urbanization in the U.S. in which many parks were created, Wright Park's development was as much about politics and economics and social change as it was about recreation. Let's look at that timing here. We're talking about, what did I say, 1890? It was 1886, it was donated. Um, like between 1890 and 1900, some trees are being planted. And in 1903, Teddy Roosevelt comes to Tacoma, and he stands right kind of where the conservatory ended up, somewhere around there. Thousands of people gather, like from all over, thousands of people line this area. 10, 15 years before had been awkward and useless, but now it is a center for, um, it's a place where Teddy Roosevelt's talking. And this is what he said, among other things. 
I wish to say just one word this afternoon to you here in this city of destiny, in this city by the sound on our foreign policy and upon what must ever be the main prop of any good foreign policy, the American Navy. The American, I mean, what? Hold on. <laughs> like, you know, wait, hold on. I thought, huh. So what's crazy about this? Not crazy, this is politics. Like that, like Ruben Kassas said in that article that I just quoted, that right park, trees, they are also political. And um, when Teddy Roosevelt came to Tacoma, he didn't go to Seattle, he came to Tacoma to say that. It was the first time he had said that in a public thing on a stump, you know, speak like speaking about what he saw was the vision of the United States. And it was about the American Navy, which is a real shift in the way the US was operating kind of globally. And I'm gonna quote Ruben Casas again. And so we can, actually, I'm, he found this article. It's a quote from the Post Intelligencer. Um, that President Roosevelt should reserve the topic of the Navy until he reached Puget Sound is regarded as most significant, not alone by the people of Tacoma, but by those who form members of his party. The speech which he delivered here today came as a surprise to those who have been following him since he left Washington. The weight of his words is great, and, we, and they were delivered in a stirring manner. The president remarked the beauty of the scene as he closed his address and stood gazing at the throngs of brightly decorated people in the beautiful sunlight scattered about the lawn and partly hidden among the trees. Whew. Yeah, that's crazy. And then he left and they planted a red oak. <laughs> um, and the red oak being significant for Teddy Roosevelt for a couple of reasons. One, he was from the East Coast. He was from a place of red oaks and white oaks and all sorts of oaks. And he was also really identified as being this like strong, burly guy. Um, and oaks also are seen as strong and happen to be burly. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so it's not a coincidence, but I think knowing that it gives us a moment of pause when we're at, at that tree. If you've been there, um, you know, it's a gorgeous tree, like all by itself, it's a beautiful tree, um, a beautiful tree that I like to talk about the fact that it produces like so many acres, acorns every year. And almost all those acorn, acorns are going um, to birds. I'm not birds, sorry, squirrels. Uh, so it, it's a wonderful tree. And also it was planted for like kind of a pretty political reason. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk about a couple of concepts too. Uh, one is this idea of witness trees. Uh, the National Park Service is, uses the term witness trees to talk about witness trees um, as silent sentinels of storied landscapes and help that help connect people, history, and places, kind of forming this nation's cultural legacy. And these silent sentinels, um, you know, are used all over the country. Like the National Mall is full of these trees. And just to kind of like make it personal to me again, I I actually one of my first tree jobs was to work at the National Mall, tagging all the trees on the mall. So if you go there and you see like 193. <laughs> I, I touched that tree at some point. Um, but they can be a lot of different kinds of witness trees are, you can think of witness trees as landmarks, but they can also as physical markers too. Uh, they were used by surveyors to kind of mark corners in properties. Um, they, so, and I, I've seen this too, like in another job that I had, I had to go through all these old assessments um, deeds, I mean, go through deeds to figure out exactly where property boundaries were. And often they would say, when you go back to the older ones, they would say something like at the elm, blah, 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 and describing an elm or an oak or something that was at a corner. Um, and they would have a distance from that corner to the, to another tree or something like that. Um, this early practice they were called witness trees in the property boundaries. And so I thought it was pretty neat. Um, it's actually an article about the Oregon white oak as being one of the early uses of the property marker in this area.
And so just more evidence that <laughs> that witness trees are referenced in surveyor notes and property deeds. And you can still find this if you go to an assessor's office. And then my really wonderful intern, Madison Kalma, thank you, Madison, did all this like digging around for information about witness trees and how different people define witness trees, found this, this kind of gem here, that bearing trees was a way that, um, that surveyors would sometimes call these trees, these witness or landmark trees. She made this comment of, as in bearing witness. So trees that bearing witness to property boundaries, bearing witness to, land, to important times in history. So kind of let's move forward with that idea of trees as bearing witness and helping us bear witness to things. Um, so I don't know if you had a chance to go to uh, the Pacific Bonsai Museum in Federal Way. Pretty neat place. Um, there is a tree there called the now called the Demoto Trident Maple. Um, and this tree is kind of special, it is very special. Um, it is, from what I can tell, and there are like different things online and in different resources uh, that say different things, but it's something like 200 years old. And it came to the United States in 1913 in preparation for the Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco. Um, and it, after the exposition, it was purchased by the D'Amato family. The D'Amato family had, um, they were uh, sort of had a family business around nurseries, around plant nurseries. They grew plants. Um, and in 1941, the family was detained in camps in Merced and Amanche. You know, as a result of Japanese internment, Shrala girl. So the tree was left at the property. Um, it wasn't really cared for. And then when uh, the son of the person who purchased it, it returned, Toichi. Okay, that's that's Toichi right there, or on the screen if you're looking there. When he returned after this really horrible thing that happened, he began taking care of the maple again. And he had gotten a degree in horticulture spent the rest of his life caring for plants. And he said in a sort of oral history that when you are out working with plants and flowers, you can't have hate in your heart. Um, and he found that like through plants, he was able to connect to so many different kinds of people in a way that from what I read sounded healing. Here's this D'Amato trident maple and we can appreciate both the tree, the way it's cared for and its history and how, how it, how it kind of survived and um, how we want to avoid having anything like that happen again. So we're, we're going to shift to the ginkgo. I could talk about the ginkgo like forever because if we're, there's so much in it, there's so much to the ginkgo. Um, but I just also wanted to say that ginkgo is a relatively young name for the plant and it has many other names. I have listed the, off the English, like the phonetic um, here of just some of them. There are actually several other names for ginkgo too. Uh, it also is considered a survivor tree. And I just learned this very recently. Again, was very surprised that this wasn't something I had heard about before. But in Hiroshima, the atomic bomb happened. You know, seeing a pattern here, right? There's certain things happening at certain times. And um, that bomb that hit Hiroshima, it killed 80,000 people immediately. Like, immediately. I had no idea the scale. And... And then 100,000 more died subsequently as a result of the atomic bomb. Lots of people died and then trees died um, and trees died. But 170 trees survived the bombing and many of them were ginkgos. And what happened that was remarkable is that they looked like completely dead, like they, they were burned entirely. And then they started leafing out and, and some of these trees were planted around temples, Buddhist temples. Um, oh, actually, I don't know if they were Buddhist uh, temples in Hiroshima. And so they started leafing out and they were became this really big symbol of survivor, sur surviving, um, of like rebirth, resilience. And it's a story like it's giving me goosebumps thinking about it because it's still a story that's very fresh. Uh, it's very it's very there in Hiroshima. And it's also part of the story of the ginkgos that we see around us. Like there are so many in Tacoma. Um, and I'll show, maybe I'll show, oh, I, I don't think I have another picture of 
This one in here is in Wright Park. And I like to show people this and then I get kind of stuck there talking about all the amazing things about the tree, all the ways that it shows resilience um, that are remarkable. Um, it didn't just survive the atomic bomb. They also survived a 7.9 magnitude earthquake in Tokyo in 1923. So 20 years earlier or so, they had survived um, a natural disaster when most of the other trees had died. The way that they have made meaning for other people is also really remarkable. Oh, I think I had, oh, oh, okay. I must, I don't know what happened to, oh, I'm not gonna tell you yet. That's what, that's what happened. I, it's a little, some, so we're gonna talk about ginkgos again. So just hold on to that. Ginkgos as survivors, as witness trees, um, and we're going to shift over to the monkey puzzle tree is probably how you know it. Uh, it has other names too. One of them is, I think, pronounced Pewen. And this tree, again, remarkable and so weird. Uh, weird and wonderful is the way I like to think about it. Uh, it. I'm still trying to figure this out. So if you have I, hints and things that can lead me to some more answers, that would be cool. But I was going on a walk one day with some people. I was leading a walk. Someone said, oh, was it you? Oh, <laughs> oh yes. So that started something for me. Um, <laughs> Georgette told me that, um, that trees were distributed at the Seattle World's Fair. I think that's what you said, right? In 1962, um, which was also called the Century 21 Exhibition. Um, but I also found out that in 1905 at the Lewis and Clark Centennial in Portland, there was a Chilean representative who brought seeds and seedlings and shared them to event goers. So um, it has a really interesting, like that's why we have so many here and that's why you don't really see them anywhere else because they didn't have like a way to get there. I think there's probably more reasons than that. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about this tree too because its story is, um, not unlike some of the other plants that we have looked at, but uh, it is considered a living fossil. It's been around since the dinosaurs, since before the dinosaurs. They come from the Andes Mountains where their habitat is threatened. So we have them here producing all these seeds. That's really great. It takes them about 40 years to produce a cone. And that cone can stay viable for 1,200 years. 1,200 years! Like that's how they've been able to, that's maybe one reason. Um, and I'm getting exciting, but uh, that's maybe one of the reasons why they have lived uh, so long and been able to survive multiple changes in climate and all sorts of, of, of things that are pretty extreme. And then I learned this recently that, that individual leaves or needles or pokey things, <laughs> if you want to get technical, um, can live 24 years, which is really unusual like generally you know we think of evergreen trees as holding on to their needles for a long time but actually they're constantly shedding their needles they might hold on to them for one two three years but they let go of them little by little whereas um these trees can hold on to their needles these for 24 years uh, the seeds are edible so they have been very important to the people of the andes mountains for that reason and then they are fire adapted, specifically fires associated with volcanic activity, which you might remember the sequoia is also fire adapted, also has lived since the dinosaurs were around. Um, and I like to think of these monkey puzzle trees or this pewen trees as, um, as like kind of their home here being a refuge. So a place of shelter and if is necessary, those um, seeds can be returned to the Andes and used. Um, and I say that because there's actually a tree on this campus at the University of Puget Sound that has that story. It's the Franklinia tree. I wanted to have some slides about it, but I don't, I decided to take it off. And here I am talking about it anyway. But the Franklinia tree was thought gone from the Altamaha River Valley in, in the, in the south, southeast. And um, meanwhile, John Bartram had been traveling all around collecting plants and brought one of these plants, or many of these plants, the seeds at least, to his home in Philadelphia. 
raised them, they had been growing. And then when there was effort to return the tree, well, to restore the Altamaha River Basin, they realized, well, we can take these trees from Bartram's home and use them to bring more trees back, more of these Franklinia trees back to the Altamaha River Valley. So when you look at monkey puzzle trees or Pewen trees, and you're like, those are so weird, they don't fit in here. Just that's okay, you know, maybe they, you know, have a purpose here too. Um, also, I think they're cool. So maybe that will just rub off on you. Um, another thing that's really cool about them is that they're so old. I usually like to make this a, um, like a quiz. How old are they? <laughs> uh, they're so old that their most, their closest relative is in Australia. How could that be? And if you think back to like classes you've taken in a long time ago, you might remember that the continents were all together at one point and South America and Australia were touching. And at that time, there were these monkey puzzle trees or some version of them, Pewen, and there, and then they split. And so we have these Pewen in the South America and we have these Wallamy pines in Australia. And while my pines are not actually pines, they're they actually have their own group. Wallemia nobellus of Australia. I have a video here. I'm gonna see if it works. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, I'll just tell you what she says. Okay. I think it's probably not gonna work. So I'm gonna pause it and I'm just gonna tell you what it says. Um, but I liked bringing in the idea of bringing in a guest speaker for this talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And she's from Australia, so she pronounces it correctly. Or they, she pronounced it how they pronounce it in Australia. Oh, I think I think it's having trouble loading. Oh, okay. So I'm just I'm not gonna try. Uh, yeah. Oh, there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so she's smiling and she talks about how um, it's called nobilis because um, the tree was thought extinct. Like they didn't. There was no evidence. It, supposedly, um, at least in certain areas no thought that this plant still existed. And then somebody was out walking around in uh, New South Wales, I think, and came across this plant. And they were like, what is this thing? Uh, and then it, they realized that person's last name was Noble. And so they realized this plant was the Wallamy pine. And that Wallamy pine um, was still alive. And apparently the other thing she continues to say is that nobody is told where these plants are. It's kept secret so that nobody will go and disturb it. They took seeds from there or somehow propagated plants from that area. And now this Wallemi pine is in um, Bloedel Reserve, so not that far away. So look at that. The Wallemi, the Wallemi pine and the monkey puzzle tree or the Pewen are together again. I like to think about it that way. All right, so I want to introduce another top, another kind of concept here, and that's the idea of legacy trees. And legacy trees have, you know, lots of different definitions, really, but we'll think about them as these older trees that still exist in a place surrounded by younger trees. This older generation of trees providing all these benefits that come with having grown, in this case, in our place, mosses, lichens, that they might support bark foraging birds, um, insects of all sorts. And so I kind of want to take that term and think about the urban landscape, our city landscape, and talk about the K Street Tulip Poplar, which if you've been on a walk with me, you may have gone to this tree at some point. If not, maybe we can go back. The K Street Tulip Poplar, I like to call the tree that reminded us that curbs and sidewalks can be accessible even when they are straight, not straight. <laughs> or the poplar that reminded us that they can provide significant, significant shade and evapotranspiration, or the tree that can slow, slow down traffic. So basically, short part of this story is that these actually two trees were at the corner of an intersection that was going to be um, torn up, and the trees were going to be cut down because that was kind of the straightforward thing to do, the safest route in a sense. And they were going to build, you know, regular curbs. And what they did, um, what happened is they put a sign up that said, this tree is going to be cut on XYZ day. And that was like, I think, two days before the tree was scheduled to be cut. 
And people got really upset. Maybe some of you in the room got pretty upset and started calling the city, calling the project manager, making phone calls, calling council members, calling neighborhood associations. And what happened is that put a pause on the project, just a little pause, enough for people to go out and say, well, are there alternatives? Can we do this project without removing these trees? And what they discovered is, I'll go back a little bit, picture this picture, is that in fact, there was enough space in this intersection to do a bump out or a, um, a bulb out sometimes it's called to make more space at the corner for the trees and still have the safe um, access. And the result is really beautiful. Like you can, you feel there's a calmness at that corner that um, you can feel as a pedestrian. So it's a very pedestrian friendly intersection and it's a tree friendly intersection. And this is actually, while we're on tulip poplars, I just want to actually make a call out or if anybody knows anything about this tree. So at Wright Park, there's another tulip poplar. It's right next to the bocce court. Um, and I was, again, on a walk. Um, and it wasn't you this time. <laughs> and somebody said, oh, the Columbus Day storm of 1962. And I was like, huh, I don't know anything about that. So I looked it up. And it was an extra tropical cyclone. If you were, was anybody in Tacoma? OK, so maybe you remember this event. Um, one of the most powerful recorded in history uh, in the US, approximately 80 miles an hour winds in Tacoma, maybe even 100 to 179. They don't actually know because the weather stations blew, blew away. Um, and noting the date, 1962, it was the same time that that Seattle exhibition was happening, the 21st exhibition, the one that maybe had some uh, pewen or monkey puzzle trees at it. It, so it closed the World Fair. And what I think happened, I think what I was told and what I would love to know is that the top of this tulip poplar fell off during that storm. I don't know if that's the case, but I would love to know. Uh, so if you have any information, please share. So yeah, do you know, did the top get blown off on Columbus Day storm? And if you know, please tell me afterwards and that would be fantastic. Or if you have hints, because I haven't been able to find anything else about it. There are not, not a lot of photographs from after the storm or anything that I could find, unless maybe they're in the Northwest room. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about Praxinus, the ash, ash family, it's whole family. Um, we have a bunch in Tacoma. In Tacoma, they're more like, uh, I would say they're more like specimen trees. In a lot of cities in the United States, they were major parts of the, of the urban forest. Uh, significant number of ash trees planted up and down streets, throughout parks might hear that I'm using it in past tense because green, um, the emerald ash borer uh, in a very short order uh, killed a lot of the ash trees on the East Coast. It is now in Oregon. This is not a story about that, but let's keep it in mind. Um, I wanted to talk about this Norse mythology. So we're going like way back in time to our relationship a relationship to trees. Um, in Norwegian folklore, uh, there is this idea of this ash tree. Uh, so this ash tree is kind of like, it is the center of everything. Um, the, the gods are in one spot, the world of humans in another, um, other kinds of folks in another spot. And, um, and they're all cared for by these three women um, who are these powerful figures who are caring for this tree, nurturing this tree, and also kind of controlling who has access to the tree. Because if you access the tree, like Odin did, Odin, who's, you know, like this big important god in, North, in Norse mythology, um, kind of like the god's god, and he sought wisdom. So he, he, there's a whole story about him and this tree, but there's more to it. The myth goes that when it dies, the whole world of God dies with it. And it's mentioned in all sorts of things as this tree is only sacred. It's not only sacred, it's mortal, sorely in need of compassion and protection. I, I just, i am really been for many years kind of hung up on this idea that trees and our relationship to trees is profound. And that if we can think of our way of caring for trees as some opportunity for practicing compassion and protection, that maybe we can share that, sort of spread that out, not to plant, not just to plants, but to everyone, to all beings everywhere. 
So here's the story. Story goes that the tree dies, the world shadowed in darkness. Everything's quiet. But it also goes that this is a tree of rebirth and regeneration. So I want to return to the witness tree for a minute here. And there's this, you know, we talked about witness trees as witnessing places, witnessing events from the past. Um, there's also a place called Harvard Forest where um, foresters or students of forestry, I went there many times, get to like look at how things change over time. So there's the forest, but then there's the museum about how um, the forest has changed over time, how humans have changed it, how climate has changed it. And so the forest itself becomes this kind of witness to, in this case, climate change, bearing witness to climate change. Climate change is scary and it's big and it feels so hard to tackle. And even as somebody who plants trees, like uh, cares so much about planting trees, I too find like, what's one tree gonna do? Well, it is gonna do something. Um, so you're almost going to have to have faith in that. I wanted to return to the ginkgo, this survivor tree. And I promised I would come back to telling you one thing about ginkgo in particular, which is that it's not just a living fossil. It is the oldest tree that we have. It's the oldest continuously reproduce, reproducing tree. It's been around something like 270 million years, and ginkgos were everywhere. So much so that... Even 15 million years ago, there were ginkgos in Vantage, Washington. And ginkgos, I didn't say it before, but now we think of them as being associated with a very small region in China. Um, but at one point, they were all over the world, even here. And so I really like, I'm just going to read this part here from Peter Crane, who, who is, was a um, expert in ginkgos. It's a bit like those diagrams that you see where there's a picture of the Milky Way and there's a little sign that says, you are here. Well, it's the same idea. Guess what? We're not at the center of everything. And guess what? The universe doesn't revolve around us. And guess what? We're only here for a short time, whereas some things have been here for a really long time. And that ought to encourage us to take the long view as we think about our relationship to the natural world. And I find that when I look at ginkgos and I think about the fact that they have gone through so much and they're still here. And not only are they still here, they're still adapting to the world around them. And it's it's really remarkable, I think. And that's kind of how I want to almost close up. I'm going to say that I was in Bainbridge Island the other day and they have a, a little exhibit happening at their history museum on um, sharing stories. It's called Trees. And there are a bunch of stories about trees in Bainbridge Island, photographs of them. And they have this wall with, I think it says, trees are essential to healthy communities. How do trees help you? And on the other side, I think it says something about how do you, um, why do you love trees or something like that? Sharing stories, learning the histories of trees is important and meaning can be meaningful. And creating meaning around these living objects that, not living objects, living beings that have been here for really a long time. I mean. Oaks are like the young ones in the in the world, and they've been around 56 million years. So, um, yeah, that's pretty remarkable.